Yeah, fantastic. Um, you guys are a little more lively than the first service, but I will say this, uh, the first service is always more on time. Uh, they fill the seats earlier, so kudos to them on that. Um, hint, hint, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, if you weren't here on Sunday night, like Kyle was talking about, we've got these boxing gloves here. And uh, this is really, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure you didn't think you were getting like a real boxing glove so you can't, you know, punch the person that you rode with. But, um, you know, it says on there, I'm fighting for. And the idea is for you to be able to write down what it is that you're fighting for. And uh, we even laminated these. So if you want to write that down in dry erase marker, and then once you conquer that thing you're fighting for, you can erase it and then write something else that you're fighting for. Uh, so that's what this is. But I want to give you guys some, a little bit more context to this, uh, this series here. And uh, before I go on, Patrick, you can turn me down just a hair, but I don't need to hear myself twice. And the echo, I mean, no one wants to hear. You guys barely hear me once, so twice is too much. But, um, you know, I was praying for you guys, praying for this church and praying for uh, what God wants for South Point. And really, when I pray things like, what does God want for South Point? I'm really, you know, I'm praying like, what does God want for for you? Because if if it's not good for you, then it's not something that we are even, you know, that we want to do here. Or it's, I I don't have an agenda that I'm pushing for. My agenda is to do things that are good for you, things that work for you, things that make you uh, or help you to be better, live a better life. And and as I was praying, God put this story, this image in my mind, and I did share this at the worship night, but I'll I'll reshare it with you here. But he gave me a picture, and, and this picture is a, is a story. And I just want you to imagine that in this place, it's not a kind place. Uh, it's not a safe place. It's a dangerous place. Uh, it's full of unkind and hurtful things. And it's a, a scary place to be. But in, in the middle of this place, there is a kind of a beacon of hope, and it, it's, it's the safe house. And the safe house sits in the middle, and there's only one door in and one door out. And if you're inside the safe house, then you're safe from everything that's outside of the safe house. And there's this kind of opportunity, this daily opportunity, where every day for about 10 minutes, the door for the safe house opens. And when it opens, anyone that can make it into the safe house is allowed to come into the safe house. But after 10 minutes, it shuts and then it's, it's done until the next day. And so then everybody outside is then forced to, you know, fend for themselves. And so what we got really good at doing last year is when that door opens for the 10 minutes, we stand at the edge of the doorway and we shout and we say, hey, come on in. Hey, hey, if you're out there and you can hear my voice, come into the safe house. You don't have to stay out there where it's dangerous, where it's dark. You don't have to get hurt. Come on in here. We even got really good at shouting loudly and trying to get the word out to more and more people to come and join us in the safe house. And as God gave me this series or this idea, uh, this burden called, you know, this is the year we're going to fight for it. You know, first I started to unpack it. Is this just for me and my family? Is this also for the church? And it very clearly was for us as a church. But most things that are for the church start with me at home, start with me and Casey and our marriage and our family, which is why it's, our marriage is so important to us. But, but I, the idea of fighting for it means that now when the door opens to this safe house, instead of standing there shouting and calling people to come in, we are now going to go and run out and grab as many people as we can. If you were in the safe house and you knew that outside was a dangerous area, and if you knew that anyone that got stuck outside, that, that even their life maybe was on the line. You know, if it's a random stranger, some of us would run and go grab them. Some of us would say, well, you know, hope, hope, you know, good luck to them. But there are a few good ones in us that would run and go grab people. But what if, it's, what if it was like, your, like a loved one that was out there? You know, I know that I would sprint to go get them and try and get them back in before the door closed again. And so this idea of fighting for is, is we're fighting for, for people 
Matthew, you can go back a slide here. We're, we're fighting for people here. You know, we're, we're fighting for each other. We're fighting for those that aren't in the safe house. If this church is the safe house, I don't necessarily mean this room, but I mean us as a, as a people here. If this is the safe house, some of you are here today because somebody invited you into the safe house or somebody went and got you and brought you into the safe house and you found that this is a good place to be and you enjoy it and you like it and it's good for you and it's good for your family. And we hear lots of stories like that. But I don't want you, we're not going to get comfortable here. We need to go out and find more people and bring them in. And when you go out, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight with people or fight for people, maybe with people, for people. And so this, this burden that was placed on my heart that God has so graciously allowed us to turn into a, a series here of we're going to fight for it. This encompasses, it was born out of a burden for the lost which at one point we were all lost. But it, it, it goes further than the burden for the lost. And it also goes into the burden for the hurting. It goes into the burden for families. It goes into marriages. It goes into relationships. It, go, it goes into everything. And so what, for the next month, we're talking about this fighting and how to fight for it. But, but the it is for the lost. It's for those that are out there. The it is you. It's your relationships, your marriage, your relationship with yourself. The it is, is for your job or for those strongholds that I spent the last three weeks talking about. That thing in your life that you can't overcome, the addiction or the medication, the drinking, the anger, the rage, the w whatever it is. That thing that's taken up a stronghold in you. And that's, that's what we're fighting for. That's what you can write on your boxing glove and say, no, this is the year that I'm going to fight. So there's four things we're going to learn about fighting uh, in the next month. Today we're going to learn how to fight a lion. That's going to be cool. Everyone's going to walk out of here and drive up to Kruger Park and display your skills in fighting a lion. All right? So how to fight with... No, don't be poachers. I guess that makes you a poacher. I didn't think about that. Don't do that. Then next week we're going to talk about how to, how to fight with, your, with open eyes. And, and, and that's going to make a, a lot more sense. But... You know, sometimes when we're in a fight, we don't see who's around us to help us. And there's this amazing story in the Bible that talks about um, a, a prophet that's going to war. And they feel outnumbered. They feel lost. They feel like they're never, they can't win this thing. And their eyes are open. And they see they actually have this angelic army around them. And the angels fight with them. It's going to be super amazing. And then it's how to fight even when you're losing. Because we need to address that sometimes we just feel like we're losing this fight over and over and over again. But even then, there's still, we can still walk out as, as winners. And then how to fight when you know that you're going to win. We're going to be looking at some stuff in the book of Revelations on, on that. But, you know, the hope is that at the end of this month, we step into a fight night or a worship night. And in this night, we're able to celebrate and praise God for what we've overcome and the battles that we've won. But we're also able to bring forward those that we have not won all the way yet and rally together as a community in worship and in prayer and help fight with each other and for each other. So if we're going to get into a fight, if we're going to learn how to fight, the place that we're going to start today is lesson one. This is lesson one on learning how to fight. You have to decide and you have to choose. Because if you, if you can't make the decision to fight, then there is no victory that can be won. So that's important for you to understand. Put it on the screen here. If you can't make the, the, the decision to fight, then there is no victory to be won. That, don't overcomplicate this. This is simple here. If you avoid a fight then you can't win or lose in that fight. It, it all starts with the decision. I'll share a story about myself. When I was in grade, I think maybe like nine or 10, I got into a fight on a school bus. And we had, if you, I'm sure you've seen it in the movies, um, or if you've been to the States, maybe you've seen it, these big yellow school buses. And on the yellow school bus, it would drive around and there'd be pickup points. And it would pick up all the kids and then take the kids to school. And so I rode the bus to school. Um, wouldn't that be great, parents, if you didn't have to drive your kids to school every day? 
Yeah, amen. Amen to that. Um, we live in Pinelands. Our kids go to school in Pinelands, and it still takes us like 45 minutes to get them to school and back. So these buses were a great service to parents, but uh, we rode the bus, and on the bus, it was, you know, it had 50, 60 kids on the bus, and there was a day, there was a kid on the bus that was messing with one of the girls on the bus, and he was kind of getting onto borderline, you know, uh, like assault on her and making her, she was obviously uncomfortable, and she started out first trying to defer and laugh it off, but he kept pushing and pushing, and then it got to the point where it was, I mean, it bothered me, where it was my stop to get off the bus, and as I stood up, put my bag on, I heard her like scream, say something, but he had, he had touched her inappropriately, and right then and there, so there, there's the saying, not my monkey, not my circus, well, I, this was not, I wasn't, this wasn't for, I mean, I was not in this situation. But in that moment, I made the decision that this was a fight that I was going to take. And I turned around and I punched him in the face, hit him right in the nose. And I, somebody asked, because I, I didn't finish the story in the first service, but um, yeah, I, I got a few good licks on him. They jumped on us. The bus driver broke it up. And um, so, I, you know, it was a good outcome. I ended up getting suspended from the school bus, but it was a weird suspension in that the principal said, I can't let you ride the bus for a few months, which for me was like, great, because the bus is for nerds, so now I'm going to get to ride with a friend to school. But he did shake my hand and say, but I understand what you did and, and why you did it there. But it was, I, I made a decision. So if you don't make a decision to get into a fight, to fight, then there is no fight. It's, it's I mean, this... I. I don't want to, this is not a complicated thing. Don't look for metaphors here. This is just like real, literal stuff. If you choose not to fight, there is no fight to win. There's no victory to win, and there is no, uh, there's not even anything that you can lose, which is why many of us choose not to get into a fight, because we don't like the idea that we could lose, or that there could be pain or something involved in it. But I, I want you to be encouraged by the end of today that you can make the decision to take the fight. You can make a decision to fight a lion today. I'm going to show you how. And we're going to do that through looking at a guy named Benaiah. Now, Benaiah, and his, his name means the, the Lord has built. And Benaiah was a warrior. And, and he was a, a, a true warrior with a warrior's heart. And he's got this really cool kind of like presence in the Bible. And you can read his story. There's not a lot written about him. He, he's not like everywhere is not a really in-depth character, but what we do have about him is, is pretty significant and really cool. If you struggle reading the Bible, then this is cool stuff to read. Because Benaiah, he was born a Levite, which means that he was supposed to be a priest. But instead of being a priest, he ends up being a, a warrior. And we learn later that he was a bit of an of a outcast. And Benaiah would go on to serve King David. He would go on to serve King Solomon, but also Benaiah did some really amazing things. He, he killed an Egyptian. There was an Egyptian man who was 2.2 uh, meters tall, or if we're going off of the correct measuring system, he was seven feet tall. And um, the Bible says he was five cubits tall. But this is a big Egyptian. And Benaiah goes into this battle, this fight with him. And he's got a staff, and the Egyptian has a spear. And Benaiah, not only does he kill the Egyptian, but he does it with his own spear. And then there's another story the Bible talks about where Benaiah took on two Moabite men, and their nicknames were, was that they were men like lions. And he, he conquered them, he, he killed them. So you've got this guy, this warrior here, who, who has this sort of pedigree of a history. And he's the guy that we're going to be learning from uh, today. But, but I, I just want to illustrate like how hardcore this guy is. In, in fact, th this is kind of what his armor would have looked like or his, his uniform would have looked like when he was serving with David, which is where we, we start to see him first. So Benaiah comes into the picture when King David has to flee Jerusalem. We find King David sitting in a cave. This is the Adullam cave. And King David has, has fled Jerusalem. He's fled the kingdom because Saul is king. And Saul wants to kill David. 
And so David is fleeing. He knows that he's been anointed to be king, but he's fleeing for his life. And if you want to know what David feels like in that moment, then read Psalm 142. Because it's while David is in this cave that he writes that psalm. And this is a big cave and he goes to it and he sits in this dark space and he just talks to God. God, where are you? Why is it that I am, I am alone here just to die in this place? And over time, while David's hiding in this cave, people start to come and they start to gather around David. In fact, you had 400 men that showed up. And, and this gives you a good kind of picture of this illustration of how big the cave is. Because I think, well, how do 400 men, uh, you know, in a cave? When I think of a cave, I think of a small thing, which then I chuckled because I thought of 400 men standing like this, you know. Uh, because they couldn't stand up all the way in the cave. But it's quite a, a big cave here. And so David goes from being completely alone to now he's got 400 people. And these 400 men, these were the guys that they were the outcast. They, they were the rebels. They were the ones that, that were in debt to people. They were the ones that, that were persecuted because they were maybe a little bit different. Which is kind of what makes me start to think about Benai. Was, Benai was supposed to be a priest, but he became a warrior instead. And Benaiah is part of this 400 people that have shown up to help David. So this is when we start to see Benaiah enter the Bible. And out of these 400 people, this like elite crew is, uh, is, is brought together. And, and th this is known as David's mighty men. And there was 30 mighty men. Actually, there was technically 37, but, but they sort of had a rotation. So people kept, there was the problem where they were dying and so then they were being replaced. But on average, they had about 30 guys. And these were the hardcore of the hardcore. So here you have David hiding. 400 rebels join him. And out of those 400 rebels, 30 of them are so extreme that they are made into their own group. One of these guys, he took a spear and he killed 800 people by himself alone with a spear. And some of us can't walk 800 steps without getting winded. You know, I, I thought, you know, to kill somebody with a spear, have you ever swung a hammer 800 times or raised your arm? Go home today and just raise your arm 800 times. Anything you do 800 times is exhausting. How did this guy, one of these guys, actually take a life, take 800 lives with one spear? There was another guy that did something very similar where he conquered 300 men. He killed 300 men with a single spear all by himself so these were the hardcore of the hardcore and Benaiah again who's entered our story here he is put in charge of these 30 men so you have David you've got the 400 out of the 400 you've got the 30 and then out of the 30 you've got Benaiah that's leading them and if we follow David's story we get to see how Benaiah continues to be loyal and how he continues to lead and how he continues to be this warrior, one of the mighty men that he deserves to be recognized in being. In fact, David would have this sort of tragic thing that would happen later in his life. He would make some bad decisions and, and he would lose some favor with God and he would have both of his sons, Absalom and then uh, Adonijah, would end up trying to take the throne from David. And when Absalom tried to take the throne from David, David actually had to flee and he fled and he, he went and he hid. Eventually he came back and they battled and uh, Absalom, he ended up dying. This is also, you know, if, if you're not excited about reading the Bible, these stories are, are amazing. I mean, they're real events that happened, but Absalom was riding his horse and his hair got stuck in a tree. And so he hung from a tree by his hair and somebody from the other team came up, the other team, the other army, the military, found this guy hanging in a tree by his hair and then, and then took his life that way. I mean, that's, the Bible is an exciting thing to read. But so that was Absalom. And then Adonijah, his other son, his fourth son now, tried to take over David's throne. And still, Benaiah is part of David's bodyguards. He's part of David's armies. He's, he's part of these 30 men. And when Adonijah tries to take over, because Solomon is supposed to be king, and Adonijah tries to take over, 
uh, Benaiah plays a really important role in making sure that the kingship transitions well from, from David to Solomon. In, in fact, Solomon here, when he's made king, Solomon ends up using Benaiah as a hitman. So Solomon's got a problem with Adonijah because Adonijah is trying to take the throne. So what, what he ends up telling uh, Benaiah to do is to go like a hitman and kill Adonijah, and he does. Then there's a guy named Joab, and Joab was actually David's military leader, his commander. And Joab uh, betrays David and sides with Adonijah. Solomon says, go take care of him. Benaiah goes out, takes care of him. And then there's a, a third, a guy named Shemia, same thing. Solomon says, go take care of this guy. You know, let him sleep with the fishes. And then Benaiah goes out, takes care of him. So when Benaiah was a hitman, this, this to me is like, um, I mean, he would have been a terrifying guy, a warrior with a warrior's heart, fierce loyalty to David, you know, leading the 30 elite men, leading the bodyguards, used as a hitman uh, across David's reign and then across Solomon's reign. But that's not the most important thing we're going to focus on today. But I wanted you to understand how much of a warrior he was. I needed you to know, for the rest of this to work, you needed to know what kind of guy Benaiah was. Because he doesn't have a lot of scripture in the Bible. It's easy to read over it, to glance over it, and to move on from it. But you, you need to understand how hardcore this guy was. And so even though he'd killed the Moabites, and he'd led the armies, and he'd fought for David, and was a hitman for Solomon. Benaiah was also a, a, a lion slayer. And Benaiah uh, has, has this event that happens in his life, which is what we're going to focus on today, where Benaiah ends up having to, to kill a, a lion. And he's only one of three people in the Bible that have done this. So you have three people, David and Samson and Benaiah. Those three people killed a lion with their bare hands. Just those, those three. And so Benaiah, as this lion say, let, let, let's look at how this kind of unpacks here. It's in 1 Chronicles. You see this in 1 Chronicles. And if, if you want to be interested in this, if you want to read about more of David's mighty men, if you want to hear about more of those guys, read this, read this whole chapter. Because this is really amazing stuff. So Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. See, in, in verse 22, like in verse... 18, 19, 20, it was talking about some of David's other mighty men and all the things that they had done. We, we get to Benaiah, and, and the scripture introduces him as the son of Jehodiah, the son of a courageous man of Kabzeel. Now, Kabzeel was located in a place that now today we kind of know as the, the Negev region, the Negev desert. And this is significant because this is a place that is well known for having lions present. In fact, in the Old Testament, around this time, there was a prophet, and this prophet was disobedient to God, and God actually had a lion come out of the wilderness and kill this prophet. And there's a whole story about that as well. I think it's in 1 Kings. So there were, we know that there were lions in the area. So it's, it's significant where he comes from here. And so this guy, he killed two sons of Ariel of Moab. That's the two sons that were... They were men like lions. And then he also went down and he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. This sentence gets worse as it goes. So the first part, he killed a lion. That's pretty bad. In a pit, that's even worse. On a snowy day, that's even worse, worse. So you read this sentence. Do you get it now? You guys are a little slower than the first service. But he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. The story gets worse as the sentence goes on. And then just to illustrate more of his feats, it goes on in verse 23. And it says he killed this Egyptian man, a man of great stature, five cubits tall. In the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a, a weaver's beam. And Benaiah went down to him with only a staff or a rod. And he grabbed the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. That's, that's the kind of warrior Benaiah was. So, Benaiah the lion slayer jumps into a pit with a lion on a snowy day and kills the lion. Now that, it's one sentence in the Bible. But there's so much 
behind that one sentence that we're going to pull out today that's going to teach us how to fight our own lions. But before we can do that, I need you to understand the lion that Benaiah fought against. And so I've got a video for you because I want this to, to drive, I want this to hit home with you. And while you watch this video here of this lion, I want you to imagine yourself as Benaiah standing there. And in the video, there's a guy filming and he's behind the safety of a fence. But imagine that there is no fence there. So guys, you can play the video for us. I promise there's a nice video. There we go. Yeah, could you imagine having that come, come at you? Uh, Johan, play that again with the volume so we can hear this lion roar from the beginning. Look at this guy. I mean, that is a scary, scary sight. Dead. So that's what Benaiah was up against. That, that's what... There's, our, there's your volume. So that's what, he's, that's what he is up against. So it's not just that Benaiah killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. But Benaiah turned, if you actually read and, and you read into different translations in the scripture, some of them say that Benaiah chased the lion into the pit and killed him on a snowy day. So that one sentence in the Bible killed a lion. But what is that lion? That's why I wanted you to see that. Because that, that's the, the apex predator that he was up against. Now, how and why did this happen here? The how is that Benaiah's town that he lived in, it was in, like I said, the Negev region, and it was just full of lions. Lions roamed free. They largely stayed away from people. They didn't get around people, but, but lions roamed free. And often, maybe sometimes, I say often, but maybe sometimes, lions would start to, to circle the camps or circle the cities and become a bit of a nuisance. I experienced this in Namibia. I was leaving the skeleton coast in Namibia. And as we were pulling out of the, out of the, the Skeleton Coast National Park, there's a, a station there that you have to pull into and you have to check out. So you check in on one side, check out on the other side. And they had, the, the fence was closed. And so we pull up to the fence, honk the horn, they come out. They open the fence, we pull through, they shut the fence, and they scurry back into the ranger station. All the windows closed. This is Namibia in like January. All the windows closed, doors closed, everything. And we did kind of the paperwork and all that stuff and then just asked them, you know, what's going on? And they're like, well, we've been stalked by a lion for a few days now. There was a lion that had been circling their camp, getting closer and closer, waiting on one of them to go out at night to use the bathroom alone or to get kind of separated. And these, these guys were terrified. They were terrified that this lion was stalking them. So we asked, you know, are we, are we in danger? And, and they're like, you know, yes. If, don't get out of your vehicle and walk around. Get further away. And we thought, well, can we see it? Do you know where it is? And they said, you know, no, that, that they see it only when it comes and it attacks. And so that's close to probably what was happening around Benaiah's hometown. There was probably a lion that was being a nuisance surrounding the place, watching for that kid to get separated from his parents, watching for maybe the cattle or the livestock to get separated out, and then going in for a kill. And so Benaiah has to ask himself this question, which answers the why. Why would he chase a lion in a pit? We well, probably felt that he had a duty as a father because he had a son. Uh, he was a son, so he probably felt that duty to protect his father. There was a, a duty that came with protecting his town, his village. But there was something in him that he felt like this was not okay. And he could not stand or sit any longer and let this continue to happen. And so that's how and why he ends up in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. He turns and he chases this lion. It falls into this pit. He drops down and he kills the lion. 
Now, I told you that the first step to getting into a fight is you've got to decide. You've got to make the decision to get into the fight. And Benaiah had a moment where he decided and he made the choice of, yes, I'm going to go and take care of this lion. I'm going to go kill this lion, trap it in a pit. See, if we don't make the decision to get into a fight, then a fight doesn't happen. If Benaiah did not make the decision to go and fight this lion, then I would not be able to use this as a sermon illustration today. I'd have to make a different one. So like, Benaiah made the choice. He made the decision. Now, I spent a lot of time building up who he was as a warrior because it kind of makes sense. That someone with that kind of warrior heart, someone that would attack two Moabite men, someone that would take on an, an Egyptian who was, you know, so much taller and bigger and stronger than he was. It kind of makes sense that that's the kind of guy that would go and jump down into a pit with a lion. I, I wanted you to understand the magnitude of the warrior that he was, the muscle, the heart, the mindset of nothing. This, this animal is not going to take my village uh, captive because I, I almost wanted you to feel really far away from who Benaiah was. It's, it's like unobtainable. Like you, you could sit there in your chair and say, I'm not, I'm not a warrior. I'm not like Benaiah. I don't have the, the ability to, um, you know, fight somebody. The, the, there's no fight in me. I'm non-confrontational. I'll just bow down and say, no, you're right. You're correct. There's not a chance. The sermon is done at this point because I can't continue to identify with this warrior with Benaiah but I, I want to draw you back to him here because it, it turns out that if you're a Christ follower as much of a warrior as Benaiah was you are also a warrior you know if you're not a Christ follower there's some armor and some weapons and some secret sauce that you you can't quite arm and equip yourself with but if you are a Christ follower then you are a mighty warrior like Benaiah. See, Benaiah didn't have uh, a savior that died on the cross for him and rose and filled him with grace and with mercy. We have that. Benaiah didn't have those spiritual, those eternal battles already solved and fixed and already conquered and living in victory. Whereas, whereas we, we do have that. See, we don't need to be a warrior like Benaiah was because we have Christ and what he does in our life. So when we talk about fighting our lions and what maybe would would be our line we don't need to be the warrior of Benaiah because we are the warrior of a child of Christ and as a child of Christ we get to also put on this armor and these weapons and and we've you know I've been talking about this I'm going to continue to kind of like pound this into our heads so that we understand this but we've got the belt of truth. The belt is my favorite to talk about. Can you fight a lion with your pants down at your ankles? No, it won't work out very well for you. The belt of truth holds those pants up. That belt of truth, the truth is, is that you are a warrior. You are a conqueror. You are a valiant warrior of God. The battle has already been won. The fight that you're going to choose to take and get into actually has already been won. It's just a matter of putting on the armor and stepping into it and making a decision that I'm going to get into this fight. You've got the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. You, you're ready. Don't you dare think that, that you're not as good as Benaiah. See, I needed you to understand how amazing Benaiah was because you're 10 times more amazing than that. Even in your humanity, your frailty, if you feel like you're frail, if you feel like you're not a fighter, in your quietness, in your humility, in your meekness, in your peace, in your gentleness, you are a mightier warrior than Benaiah could have ever been. Because as a Christ follower, the victory has already been won for you. And so can you make the decision to turn and face your lion? Because you are a victorious warrior. That's you. That's in you. If you can make this decision, it, it all starts with the decision. Next week, we're going to learn uh, that when you get into a fight and, and you feel overwhelmed, like you, you don't have enough on your side, you don't have enough to go up against it, we're going to learn that you actually do have enough. 
And there are some things in the, in the spirit world that some things that are unseen that are powerful and they're for you and they're amazing. And it just reinforces that this victory has already been won. But that doesn't matter if you don't choose to get into the fight. Nothing else applies until this choice is made. And so you've got to choose to make the decision to face your lion. So what could be your lion? You know, for, for me, it's the things that I write on this boxing glove. But somewhere, somehow, in your life, in every single person's life in here, there is a nuisance in your life. It is circling your camp. And it waits for you to get alone. And it attacks it waits for you to get separated from your encouragement, from friends, family, from your church. And when it finds you separate and alone and vulnerable, it comes for you. It's that stronghold in your life, the stronghold of addiction or anger or the stronghold of, uh, of, of, of mourning or, or you're upset with yourself. You don't believe in yourself. It's a stronghold that, that your history has built in your life and it's currently running and ruining your life. Maybe that's what your lion is. You know, you've got to make the choice to take this fight. But somewhere in your life there's a nuisance that's circling that wants to pick you off. And it's keeping you afraid. It's keeping you huddled up out of fear. And I, I'm afraid for you guys because I'm, I'm, I'm really afraid because I'm afraid that if we don't make the choice to step into this fight, I'm not saying win the fight. I'm saying it, 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 we'll deal with that next week and the week after and the week after and the week after. Today, it's just about dealing with are you going to make the decision to step into it? And it, it's, it's not an easy decision. You know, even in Casey and I's life, we have been living this out. You know, God gave us this word. And I, I sat and I wrestled with it and I thought about it. Is this for me? Is this for our family? Is this for the church? And God put this word on my heart and he said, no, yes, this is very much for the church. And, and so we've been planning, planning, planning. And the month of February is the month where we launch that we are going to fight with it. That's when this series launches and we've got all this stuff planned for it. And even at home, we've kind of been personally gearing up for it. And then February 1st, you know, it's like, okay, we're now, we're in February. We're in the, the February fight, fight for February, fight for, Fe you know, we're just, we're ready. And three days into February, Casey and I were talking last night. We felt like we've already been just punched in the nose like 10 times. Like we've already hit the deck. We've already had the 10 second count and barely gotten up in time. I mean, it's just crazy how it comes at you. And usually what happens in the church kind of first happens in our marriage and in our family. And we overcome it and it's a good reminder. I mean, I, we were talking about this last night. I told Casey we were sitting outside because it was what, like 100 degrees last night. Yeah, yeah, it was horrible. So we're sitting outside where it's also hot but we're just outside we're trying to find the breeze, which is non-existent or, you know, at the at last night at the time. It was, a, it was a hard night last night, but we were sitting there, we were talking and I was just telling her like, man, this has been a good reminder that it, fighting is actually hard and it's actually hard to make the decision to get into a fight. And it's hard to make a decision to stay in it. See, we, we made the decision, we're going to get into this fight. We're going to fight for you guys. We're going to fight for the lost. I, I've got uh, messages on my phone screen, on my computer screen, on my iPad screen, everywhere, on my watch, everywhere that says, uh, what will I do for the lost? And then it says, um, get in a fight, fight for it. And then it says, do the hard thing. So every time I open any screen in my life, I'm greeted with that stuff. And even after being inundated with all of that in my life, I'm still sitting there with my wife last night saying, we got punched in the nose. Can we just retreat? Should we just retreat? Maybe this is too hard. But we got to decide to take the fight and stay in the fight. Now, I, I just want to share that with you to kind of reveal to you like, 
It's, it's not easy. It's, it's not going to be easy. But the victory has been won. And that was what we settled on last night. We're not giving this thing up because it's, the victory is won. All we have to do is stay in this thing. And that brought up these sort of, these, these, there are some fears that I had for me and our family, but also for you guys. And these fears are based on what if you don't decide to fight? What if you don't decide to fight against your lion? Because that's where the real consequences from, come from. We think the consequence comes from fighting the lion. We could die. We could get scratched up. It could be hard. It could be like Casey and I feeling like we've already been you know, punched in the nose. But the real consequence comes from not fighting. Because if you don't fight, then you're up against this. You'll never confront your fears. So if you don't choose to fight, you're never going to confront your fears. But I, I don't want you to be captive to your fears. Stop living captive to your fears. Stop letting your fears hold you captive. Break out of this prison that you live in. But it's not going to happen if you don't make a choice to fight, to fight against those fears. But if you don't make that choice, then you will never be able to confront your fears. You will also never embrace your challenges. And when you don't embrace your challenges, you can't grow, you can't deal with them. But instead, I, I, see, I don't want you to be limited by your challenges. There, there is a, a full life out there for you to live. But if you're not willing to make the choice to go out there and fight for that life that God has sort of you know, pre-paved the path for you on, then you're never going to overcome your fear and you're never going to face your challenges. The first challenge that you face, you're going to retreat. That was Casey and I last night. We've had a, a challenge. Are we going to face it? You, you better believe we are. We're going to face that challenge. We're going to face the next one and the next one and the next one because we refuse to be limited by our challenges or to be scared away because of our fears. And for me, the most important one, the most kind of scary fear that I have for us, if we don't make the choice to fight, is that you will never, ever pursue your purpose. You'll never pursue your purpose. I don't want you to miss one more day without your purpose. See, there's a, a phrase that we used to use with Lifa. You know, uh, teaching Lifa how to problem solve which if anyone has taught high schoolers or middle school or, or elementary how to problem solve, you know that it can be, it's a journey, right? So one of the things that we would tell Lifa, which he, he today is a fantastic problem solver, I do want to say that. But one of the things that we used to tell him is don't starve in a grocery store. Yeah, right? That's absurd. If you starve in a grocery store, yeah. And it would, it would be like, you know, because Lifa would say things and, and the idea was, hey, solve your problem. Figure out how to solve your problem. And I'd say, don't starve in a grocery store. Do you imagine Quicksbar up there laying down in the middle of the baked goods, you know, aisle there. They're bringing out all the fresh stuff and you just lay there and starve to death. But, but you're, what you need is all around you. Your purpose is all, your food is all, everything is right there. Why are you letting yourself go hungry in a grocery store? And that's what it's like when you never pursue your purpose. You're laying down in life, surrounded by purpose, surrounded by meaning, surrounded by what is good for you. And instead, you just, you just lay there and starve because you don't, want to, you don't want to take it. You don't want to reach up and grab your purpose. This, this, to me, is the scariest of them all. Because if you're too afraid to make the decision to fight your lion, then you're going to miss out on this purpose and one more day lived without walking in or pursuing or at least opening up your mind and saying what could my purpose be it's one more day is just too many it needs to start today so today I want you to decide I want you to decide to chase trap and kill your lion today that that's my that's my prayer for you in this worship set that we're going to go into don't be afraid to face your fears and seize your opportunities today. So when I ask us to pray here in a minute, what I'm going to pray and ask God to do is put in your mind and in your heart 
a word or an image or a sentence or a conviction or a sense of something. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to move around the room. If you're new to the Holy Spirit, new to church, what that is, that's the helper that Jesus sends on, on his behalf. And that helper is going to move around and help all of us. And when you bow your heads and I pray this prayer, the first thing that, that comes into your mind that God puts on there, grab it. No matter how ridiculous it is or, or isn't, I want you to grab that thing and say, that's my lion. Now I just need to make the decision of am I going to choose to fight this lion? All I'm asking you to do today is say yes to choosing the fight. We'll deal with the rest of it for the rest of the month. Today, I just want you to choose yes.